today I would like to speak about well-being in the movement. So uh, how we can go beyond the uh, mind and body uh, distinction and uh, uh, answer some questions. So the starting questions of this presentation are how can we go beyond the mind and body problem? Why shall we speak about dance? Which kind of dance are we speaking about? What does movement mean? And then what next? I'm going to quickly recall uh, the body-mind problem and then uh, again quickly uh, simply present the perspective of personal constant psychology that Professor Wintrin already introduced this morning uh, about the uh, mind-body relationship. Uh, I'll also um, propose dance as a mean to access personal meaning and promote change. Uh, and some studies uh, to try to understand what movement means and how it can be used then uh, to promote change, and finally to anticipate some future direction. Um, as all of you probably uh, know and agree with me, uh, in our society we are used to a distinction where mind uh, are usually uh, considered the first and bodies come uh, later. So we are used to deal with minds more than bodies. Nowadays, there is, a, there is a contrary tendency to give more attention to brains and find uh, all the basis of all our functions in the brain. Sometimes I ask myself, is it useful? For instance, if you think about the basic uh, um, attitude of children uh, in imitating others, um, then uh, maybe you can ask, do we really need or, or to uh, refer to for instance, uh, mirror neurons to understand empathy. So my proposal is uh, to go beyond this distinction, departing from a different perspective, which is the constructivist perspective. In this perspective, uh, you have a circular relationship between knowledge and reality. Thereby, you uh, cannot consider mental and physical um, aspects as different things, but simply as different ways of construing them. This is the position by Kelly, which is called neutral monism. Kelly underlines the embodied nature of anticipation, defining behavior as our questioning act. We know an event through our way of approaching it. We ask questions about it not merely academically, but also experimentally, so with our bodies. Our own survival depends on posing questions. When we stop doing it, we die. As Kelly says, replies send men up, being acceptable conclusions. And the best they are grounds for further inquiries. The best answer to our question is two better questions. So my um, wish is that today you will go out from my presentation with more questions than answers. Uh, I want to start by a quotation by Gregory Bateson in uh, Towards an Ecology of Mind, where he imagines some meta dialogues between uh, a father and their uh, daughter. So the daughter asks, Daddy? The father answers, yes. Would it be a good thing if people gave up words and went back to only using gestures? Hmm, I don't know the usual difficult questions that often children pose to us. Of course, we would not be able to have any conversations like this. We could only bark, mew, and wave our arms about, and laugh and grunt and weep. But it might be fun. It would make life a sort of ballet, with dancers making their own music. So two points. First, let's use this metaphor of dance to enjoy. That is uh, the main indication for me, the main signal of the well-being and also to enter a different uh, kind of play and reality. The one of dance, why dance? Because in dance, as you can see from these pictures, the relational aspects is uh, into the fore, is uh, the first aspect that is common to the different kinds of dances. And which dance? We are uh, not referring to the classical dance, which is characterized by a formal, regular, a strict technique that you have to reproduce, the respect of rules and the perfect styles. This is similar to the approach to a health, where you must be healthy. This is a healthish 
attitude uh, of people uh, searching for uh, being fit, being perfect, and trying so to conform to a norm. We are rather referring to a different kind of dance, which is called modern or contemporary dance, which uh, uh, started uh, at the beginning of uh, the 1900th century in the USA uh, with uh, Isadora Duncan, who uh, made the bodies of the dancers free of tips and tattoos and uh, uh, rather uh, led them into the nature. We have other authors like uh, Martha Graham and Mercy Cunningham who focused on the center of the movement and the movement in the space, as well as uh, Rudolf von Lavan, who searched for a pure non-descriptive dance, an expression of the individual. And finally, you all probably know Pina Bausch, who founded the, the theater dance life. So what is dance in this perspective? It is not a technical, impersonal and a priori dance, but a form of immediate action transposed in a sort of space-time that is no longer that in actual life. So the aspect of play, of metaphor, which is fundamental for using dance for intervention. As uh, Isadora Duncan says, if I could tell you what it meant, there would be no point in dancing it. So dance allows us to access to a world which is difficult to express in words. This is its power. Laban uh, defines dance as uh, the poetry of body actions in the space. So how human beings speak about themselves through the movement. Uh, this is also um, is representation of uh, um, the body in the space, and uh, it is a, lab, a famous lab notation, which is, which is a very precise system to take note of the movements and the choreographies. He identifies four factors, space, time, flow, and weight. And uh, uh, it is precisely on the basis of these factors that I would like um, to read movement in terms of uh, personal constant psychology. I will combine the four dimensions of uh, uh, movement uh, proposed by Laban with the uh, contrasts proposed by the authors from uh, uh, psychomotricity. Why? Because both of them, as uh, Kelly, consider the dichotomy of construct and the unity of mental and physical. Um, I'm referring to an old study I did, um, observing two groups. One of, uh, we could call it dance movement therapy, but you will see by my examples how it's not proper dance, and another of training. The method I used was participant observation, thereby I was not outside of the field, but I, of the field, but I was inside of it. I was uh, in the meantime leading the group and observing the group collecting data. I'm not presenting uh, the results of the study in a systematic way, but simply give you an idea of how we can understand movie, movement in psychological terms and then use it for intervention. Uh, just to mention uh, what does this mean? It means to have an approach uh, to the intervention where there is a, a constant back and forth between words and uh, uh, movements. Uh, you have first to understand uh, um, personal, uh, in some way to do a personalized diagnosis and understanding of the person with personal aims, uh, and then uh, use the group and the movement uh, as a mean of intervention. Let's start from the first dimension, which is the one of uh, space. We can consider space from different aspects, uh, the self, the level, the root, the body extension, uh, and the extension in the space. I'm do, going to present the main uh, contrasts within each of these uh, um, aspects and the meaning we can find there and use for intervention. First of all, the uh, construct inside, outside. This is the fundamental distinction between me and non me. So you can understand how relevant it is just to define our identity, our organization, our being, our self. Uh, and we can also use this distinction uh, to refer to the group. So what does, this is relevant for any kind of intervention, what does define the uh, borders of the group? Are they permeable? Do they admit new elements or not? How do we want to define them? Do we want them to be more permeable or less? 
so we have to keep in mind that the pros and cons of a choice. I usually define the um, borders of the groups and the, of the activity, of this kind of activity, for instance, uh, by uh, putting all participants in a circle and uh, uh, taking their shoes off. So this is the signal that we are starting uh, the group and activity. We also need to consider uh, how uh, taking part into a group, uh, there is a threat uh, of the personal identity. This is uh, one of the main aspects in group uh, uh, psychology, which, which must be uh, considered and must be also um, uh, an element uh, on which we have to reassure the participants, especially those who are more frightened by this aspect. One way is, as I'm suggesting here, self-massaging. So if you massage your body, then you define your borders and you can take part into the group without fearing that your identity will spread out. This is particularly relevant for those who have a problem in permeability, in psycho uh, psychosis, for instance, so in this kind of disorders, but also not necessarily so strong or severe illnesses. Another distinction that we find uh, on the space dimension is the one from top and down. As you can easily understand, this dimension reminds us about power relationship. And we can see here two examples, one given by the map of the group uh, drawn by John. The name is, of course, uh, a nickname I gave to the, participant, to the participants of the group in this game of training through movement. So as you see, he uses the uh, vertical dimension to describe the group. Uh, and so this is an expression of how he reads relationship in relationships in terms of power. And again, the example of Adriana, who is uh, lying on the floor, nevertheless, trying to control the other who is uh, at an upper level. This is interesting because this is also a representation of what Vaclavic and others uh, call a, a complementary relationship, a strong complementary relationship where unexpectedly someone from the uh, lower position or the position of down position can control those who are in the upper position. So that's important again to keep in mind in a group and in an interpersonal relationship. Another distinction, as I said, is between right and left and direct and direct movements. Right and left is simple to understand. The direct movement are those who, are, who go straight away towards uh, the uh, final point and direct are those movements where you choose a different trajectory. As you can already understand from this uh, um, uh, small show I'm doing, uh, direct movement as well as the distinction between right and left, this is the reason why you put them together, is a way to simplify the world and control it. Whereas indirect movement expose you to uncertainty. And here you have some examples of people who are trying to simplify the world. Uh, the first example I'm referring to is one uh, that I could observe in a simple practice I propose, which is a conversation of gestures. And so you can see two participants, uh, two participants that they call it Albert and Maria, who really were doing something like a fight between them. So, ho, ho, he like if it was karate. Uh, and this is, uh, this is coherent with their uh, need to simplify the world. They also have uh, a low uh, cognitive impairment. And again, the example of uh, Carlina. Uh, in this case, you can see how she tried to simplify the world by sharing it in uh, left, left side and right side. And then again, how she's in that difficulty when she instead is uh, in an uh, asymmetric position uh, because this exposes her to uncertainty. In this case, uh, it is in Italian, of course, because the participants were Italians. She is dividing the group into parts. Uh, the right one uh, that uh, she explained was the, the, those who are not so skillful in physical activity and the uh, left one uh, composed by those who were uh, very skilled in physical activity, but then if you observe uh, who she, whom she put in the two parts, you understand that she's referring to something else, which is not only physical activity, but the what she considers more uh, 
intelligence or role into the group. So I was in the side of those who were skilled in physical activities, but, but for instance, uh, the co-conductor of the, uh, the co-leader of the group was in the other side, simply because, of course, due to, to the sharing of responsibilities, uh, I was used to uh, lead the group, whereas they, um, my assistant was helping each of them to do the practices. So in uh, uh, Carolina's way to simplify the world, this meant that she was less skillful, less intelligent uh, than me. That's, of course, a way of simplifying the world again. One of the key aspects of the space dimension is the distinction between uh, big movements and small ones. And uh, if, you, for instance, I would ask you to do a big movement, you can try, uh, and then a small movement, and then an open movement, then a close movement, you will probably notice that uh, big movements are often similar to the open ones and small movements to the close one. I interpret this in, term, uh, in terms of an attempt to open to the relationship rather than to avoid the relationship. And we consider this in terms of personal construct psychology as a choice of, on one side, the dilation, so to broaden uh, one's own perceptual field, to reorganize it on a more comprehensive level, if compared to constriction, which is an attempt to, to narrow the perceptual field to minimize apparent incompatibilities. This dimension is uh, absolutely relevant, not only in uh, the, uh, the way the people uh, can uh, um, for instance, introduce themselves to movements. This is a play I usually do, a practice I usually propose in the group that may help us to understand themselves and the other members of the groups to understand them, this uh, aspect of each other, but also in the way the space is used. For instance, uh, in the practice of walking into the room uh, and uh, um, meeting each other through the eyes, uh, I notice that the change uh, when I proposed this activity recently with my class uh, of students at the university, and it was really impressive to me how they were avoiding any eye contacts, and then they verbalized how difficult it was to get in contact with others uh, through their eyes. Uh, so we work, we work a lot on this dimension uh, and then going from the eye contact to the body contact, so touch, uh, precisely to help people to um, elaborate their uh, relationships, their threat of relationships sometimes, or their threat to lose relationships. Finally, within the dimension of space, we can consider the con uh, the contrast between near and far. So we can see how we can use uh, practices that uh, promote to stay nearer to each other at the beginning of the group or during the um, process, as in the case of Luisa, a small uh, hyperactive girl. You can see her leg here, uh, which is coming out from the group uh, who is round there, and so is uh, um, this is a way to uh, shorten the distance to include her into the group. Whereas during the end of the group, we used to uh, make the distance longer, so allow the people to go far away from each other to say goodbye. Speaking about the beginning and the end of the group, and we have already entered the second dimension I want to quickly present to you, which is the dimension of time. The main distinction here is between sudden or sustained movements. What can you observe? In sudden movement, you break the agreement. In sustained, whereas it's easier to keep and search for agreement. This is so evident. Uh, here I quote some examples of those groups, but I can again put uh, a recent experience I did in my class of students uh, where they were trying to imitate uh, the other person movements uh, or all the group imitate uh, one of the person of the group proposing a movement. And you could observe that when the movement was proposed to suddenly, it's uh -huh. different. Okay, uh, let's try that. For instance, if I do this movement slowly, um, so uh, we consider 
uh, they attempt to uh, reduce the time and go fast. Uh, in attempt to reduce uh, the um, phase of circumspection, which is when you consider different options uh, to take a decision. So in the decision making process, decision making process, and then uh, in the action uh, cycle, as Kelly uh, defines it. In this cycle, you have the first phase, which is a circumspection, when you consider different options. The second one, which is preemption, when you decide which, ac which action you could uh, do. And finally, control, when you do something. So if you shorten the first phase with sudden movements and the reducing time, you have an impulsive behavior. Whereas if you stay too much in the circumspection phase, uh, you risk to be uh, to never go towards an action, so never uh, having the chance to uh, validate or invalidate. So do uh, experiments and learn in your life. So again, keep this in mind uh, when you work with people, because this may be a, a powerful mean uh, to help people first uh, to take a decision uh, while uh, um, also standing the anxiety that you can feel when you are in a circumspection phase because you don't know where you will go, uh, but at the same time, uh, um, also avoid that you are there too much and you don't go further. Um, also consider that, also in teaching, in keeping the right path that allow people to follow you without getting bored, of course. The third dimension is the dimension of uh, flow. And here, the main contrast is between free and bound movements. You have two examples. You can uh, see this example of, uh, of uh, Ivana. Uh, you could say that this is not so free movement. And nevertheless, for her, characteristics is very true. Free. free movements are those who are flexible, as you can see, whereas tight movement are those which are very, very, very precise as the, uh, the movements of robots. We can interpret them in terms of loosening and tightening. Uh, loosening being uh, an attempt to uh, construct reality in a vague way. Uh, the definition is uh, that a loose, loose construct leads uh, to varying predictions. Think about dreams. Uh, you can uh, combine different realities there. You have not a precise prediction. A tight construct is typical of the mathematical and logical reasoning, where you have uh, precise predictions and uh, clear predictions. What Kali says is uh, that you need both of them, that uh, creativity is composed uh, of uh, um, a passage from loose constructs, where you try different things. Uh, take as an example, uh, improvisation in music, uh, uh, in dance, uh, in drawing, uh, and then uh, uh, repeating uh, one sequence, that is a way to tighten the construction. So a creativity cycle is composed of both of them. And again, I suggest you to uh, work with this uh, in training and therapy, of course. The last dimension, last but not least, because in some way also Laban proposed that is uh, one of the fundamental dimension of human beings is way. Why is it fundamental? Because it defines our standing ups. And this is precisely the human characteristics. And uh, what has been mentioned many times also today, the balance, the equilibrium that we have. And again, uh, you can recall how equilibrium and balance uh, deals with the, the whole person. So it is something that is uh, both physical and mental. Uh, and I would like to ask you, so you also stretch yourself, to try this difference between standing up, maybe on your tips, uh, toe tips, uh, by using strength, or rather thinking to press the floor and go up. You can do that whenever you want. You will notice a difference in the two ways. The first way is the one of the power of will, which is typical of the Western uh, uh, thought. The second one is more uh, typical of the Eastern way of thinking, the Buddhist modality, it's used in yoga, meditation, and so on and so forth, where you think that you are part of the world and the strength come not for your willpower, but from this structural coupling, as also Maturana Varela uh, defined it. That is, that I can 
give weight and receive weight. There is also a counterbalance exercise that you can do to uh, feel this. And if I have time, just in two minutes, I want to um, give an example of the use of weight to improve, uh, to use different supports. This is the case uh, of uh, Ines, who is a girl, not the one in the picture, which is, of course, uh, uh, taken by the internet, uh, uh, who suffered from ataxia. So she has a way of moving, uh, which is very similar to uh, the one I represent here uh, of walking on the eggshells. And she used to uh, use only one support to walk, which is her mother. With her, uh, the uh, therapy was to allow her to um, use different kinds of supports. So you can use other supports, not only your mother, but the other participant of the group or uh, the seat or the floor. And so practicing this, she um, was helped to disperse her dependency, which in personal construct uh, psychology means uh, to use uh, uh, different resources, to have different resources to confide in uh, and to go for help. So this is a summary of this uh, study. And so a suggestion of how you can interpret in professional terms, in psychological terms, the dimensions of movement. And you can, of course, use them to promote well-being. Uh, first, uh, so we go towards a conclusion, uh, uh, considering that uh, we can use this dimension as a, a metaphor, so a play, uh, where uh, uh, it simply goes. You don't need uh, the willpower, and then you can consider that you don't need dance in itself, but you can use different tools and even speech, but as a form of practice. Finally, that uh, interpersonal well-being is precisely in this being here. And this is my final remark, which is, in this way, we go from, as from classical dance, from a view of well-being and health as absence of illness, a state of complete well-being and pride, to a vision of well-being and health as a condition of being there, of being in the world presence, that means precisely being in the world, being together with other people, being taken in by an active and rewarding engagement with the things that matter in life. And this is how we can use the uh, movement also as a tool to improve uh, uh, well-being and promote change. I thank you so much for your attention. Yeah, here are my contacts uh, and uh, yeah, uh, thank you.